we've been in this battle. There are days that we seem to have the victory, and there are days that when we depend on ourselves that we begin to lose ground. Mm -hmm. it's, it's constant. It yeah. never goes away. Yeah. This battle is till the day, I'm convinced now, it's till the very day that we leave. Mm -hmm. But I was telling Jane this morning, I said, you know, you ever stop and think that the disciples, when we get down on ourselves, and I'll tell you, I'm my own worst enemy, because I'm a, I do not live to the potential right. that I want to live at right. for God. Right. I may be perfect in his sight, but I'm mild for God, in <laughs> my sight. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And I have to go back to that scripture that said, even if your own heart condemns you, yeah. see, it's a battle. Yeah. It's yeah. mental that this battle rages, and we can never have the victory until we get a hold of it. But the disciples, he was constantly, they're with him every day, and he was constantly telling them, oh, oh you have little faith. Yeah. He said, you see the sun the, the, the uh, sky at night and you know that tomorrow you can read all the signs yeah. going on around you yeah. but you can't see the obvious and I told Jane I said here we struggle and wonder and you know I mean we're retired we're, we're comfortable but you wonder you know and the devil always wants to take you to somewhere yeah. in the future that you don't want to go yeah. what are you going to do if you wind up in a nursing home by faith, we're never going to wind up in a nursery. Right, right. yeah. All those things come, and you battle them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you battle them in the spirit. Yeah. Resist the devil yeah. yes. in the Lord, mm -hmm. and he will flee. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we better know these promises. And you know, you see what's going on in the world today. Uh, the 401ks took a big plunge over the weekend. Nobody knows what's going to happen mm -hmm. Monday. The Korean Peninsula is on fire. Uh, these things are signs for us yeah. that where we're at. We know these things are coming. But if ever there was a time that we have to collectively come together yeah. and encourage exactly. one another yeah. Yeah, exactly. to hang on yeah. because our, our, our life is on the other side. Yeah. We shouldn't fear that trip. We should be looking forward to right. it. Right. Because only when we get over there, all this stuff's going to subside. But we're going to battle till the very end. If that were true, then that scripture that said, if it were possible, think of that. If it were, Jesus said, if it were possible, the very elect would be deceived. That's how intense this war is. And we just have to dig in and say, well, thank God. <laughs> Meaning it's not possible. That's right. We will not be deceived. We we're going to make it. Yep. No matter yep. what comes against us, no matter how bleak it looks. We have a promise. Yes. Amen. And we can't see it with these eyes. We have to see it with that spirit man. Yes. Right. Look, it's, anyhow, Amen. Yes. it's a constant battle. Yes. Yes. And if you're not in it, you better ask why. Yes. What have I done that I'm yes. being omitted in this thing? Yes. Yes. I think all of us are in it big time.
senses can detect it. By faith, you declare, I will stand. By faith. In other words, I, I, I take everything I've got and I grab a hold of him and say, my faith is in him. Yeah. I can't see anything. I, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. The market may completely disintegrate. We may go into depression. I don't know. I, I think of my grandkids and all the little Kids, I think any older person always thinks of all the little kids and how you're going to feed them and, and you know how, how we're going to live. Right. God, we 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 got young people today that don't have a clue. They think money grows on a tree; you just go out and yeah. when you need it, write a check. That's what my grandkids say. Don't write a 
to everybody that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation to show forth the praises of him who called you out of this darkness into his marvelous light. Right. And I just thought, wow, that just lined up to what the human being said right here. Yeah, yeah. that's right. from Wednesday night. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and they shall not faint. And I wrote something after Nathan preached Wednesday. I wrote eagle eye in the bottom, and I just had this vision of an eagle has a totally different perspective on the world he's looking at. And the eagle has the ability to see everything and still find its food, a little mice yeah. in the grass. Yeah. And we are as eagles. We are told yeah. to be as eagles. And stop mm -hmm. using our magnifying glass, our eagle eye, to look at the problems. Right. Stop it. Yeah. Stop it. Use your eagle eye to focus on God yeah. and look into the deeper things yeah. of him. And you focus. And you want to know the details of something? I don't need the details of the problem. I want the detail of the solution, and that's yeah. Jesus Christ. Right. So we have eagle eye yes. vision. So let's use it to encourage each other and encourage ourselves. Yeah. And then we will watch as our strength is renewed as the eagle. Let's stand and go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. Thank you for your spoken word through the testimonies this morning, Lord. To give your people boldness to share forth from glory to glory, Lord. To be encouraged, Lord. That you give your people vision, Lord, of your goodness, of your grace. That you encourage us, Lord, that you strengthen us, Lord, as we mount up on the winds of your spirit, Lord, that you are the answer, Lord, that you are faithful, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you meet every need, Lord, the healing where it goes for Fred, Lord, for Nathan's family, Lord, for that little baby, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your healing that flows freely. Lord, that we choose to believe your word, not the circumstance, not the situations, not the doubt and the fear that tries to cloud our minds. Lord, we choose to believe you, Lord, to focus on you, Lord, to look to you, Lord, to lift you up, to worship you, to gather together, to be encouraged by your people, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this body, for this house, this house of prayer. Thank you, Lord, that you are lifted up in this place, that you are magnified, that your name is lifted high in this place, Lord. Lord, yes, we say that you are worthy, that you are worthy of our praise. Lord, that you go before us, Lord, and you make the way. That you go before us, Lord, and you make the way. You make the path clear, Lord. That your word is a light to our feet, Lord. That all fear and doubt is cast aside. shall be our constant companions, Lord, as you renew our minds, Lord, by the hearing of your word, Lord, that we are transformed from glory to glory, from glory to glory, as we lift you up, Lord, as we magnify your name, Jesus, the only true revelation, the only way, the only there is a door of blessing that is open. A door 
of blessing, not of curse, but of blessing. But we must enter in through it and believe that we are able and willing and worthy to receive the blessing. The blessings were purchased with the highest price, and they are freely given to whoever says yes. Whoever says, I believe you. I believe that you picked me. I believe that you love me. I believe that you have redeemed me. Yes. You are blessed and highly favored. Every person who can hear my voice, you are blessed and highly yes. favored. Yes. The door of blessing is open. You must simply walk through it yes. and say, thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you, Lord, for the blessings that are pouring Lord. down right now. Thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, that we can boldly come before your throne of grace. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There is a promise. There is a promise that is yet to come to pass in this world. And he says, just walk through that door and let me give you things that you can't imagine. you are special. Today is special. Something is changing in your life today. Yeah. Right now. Believe. What do you need changed? See it. See it with your eyes. It is changed. Whatever that need is, it is taken care of. Yes. Right now. Thank you. Yes. Jesus. Tonight, 6.30 p.m., we will be at the New Life Center uh, for a night of worship and praise. They've asked us to come and bring the fire. Yeah. Uh, Amen. 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 Come. Yeah. Uh, it's inner city, yeah. Yes, there's principalities uh, and things that are different that are here. But <coughs> the glory of the Lord is our rear guard. Yep. And the shield of faith and the speaking the word, the sword, yep. uh, will go forth. Things that are poured into you here will release upon them there, bless them there. Um, there's a parching, there's dry ground that needs to be rained on, and the only thing that's going to satisfy it is the presence of the Lord. And we just bring in the love and the grace and the mercy. Amen. Yes. All right, let's speak the word this morning. Will you not revive us again? that your people may rejoice in you. Hallelujah. And I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law, Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ, every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened, and I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes and devour for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Yes, Lord. John and Don.
you two want to come take the offering for us this morning, please? Let's worship and praise him. The hit the place we had the third time. With the glory right. of the land, there's a way we can go there. We can live there beyond time because of you. Because of you. Because of your love, because of your blood, oh, our sins are washed away, and we will live forever, and now we have this hope because of you. city of our God because of you. Hallelujah, Lord! No more pain. No more pain. No more sadness. No more suffering. No more tears. No more sin. No more sickness. No injustice. No more death. Because of you. Because of you. Because of your love, because of your blood, oh, our sins are washed away, and we will live forever, and now we have this hope because of you. Because of you, hallelujah. Because of your love, because of your blood, oh, our sins are washed away, and we will live forever. And now we have this hope because of you. Oh, Because 
glory to your name, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. We call it the north and the south and the east and the west. You can no longer hold our children. You can no longer hold our grandchildren. You can no longer hold our loved ones. We declare it right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Take it, brother. are blind even though they have eyes. Bring out the people who are deaf even though they think their hearing's fine. All of the nations are We call you out. 
We call you out in Jesus' holy name. We call you out. Call you out. You cannot hide from the Lord. You cannot hide from the light. He is the light of the world. He is the light of the world. He is the light of the world. Overcoming. He is the light of the world. No things can be hidden from the face of the Lord. When darkness is light will reveal. His light will penetrate all those things who are thought and buried and gone. So we cry for your light to go upon the dark place of the world. The children and the grandchildren, my sisters and brothers who did not know you, Lord, run away from you. We call them back, call them back. We call them back we call them back we call them back in Jesus name we call them back we call them back we call them back yeah 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 yes. the prayers of the grandparents coming forth the prayers of the mother and father coming forth we bring them forth in Jesus name we bring them forth in Jesus name we bring them forth in Jesus name revealing father's heart revealing father's heart we call them forth now we call them forth right now the kingdom of the Lord kingdom of the Lord be in their hearts be in their hearts be in their hearts be in their hearts the children of ours are chosen from the beginning of time. We claim them back in Jesus' holy name. We claim their names. They are our seed, the chosen seed of the Lord. We call them back. Come back. 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 Them back. Them back. Give them up. Give them up, give them up, give them up in Jesus' name. We give them up, we give them up, we give them up, we give them up. We call this nation to its godly roots right now. We call this nation to its, its knees. If you will seek the face of the Lord, he will bring the restoration to this land once again. Call them out to the Lord. We call your name, Holy Lord. We call your name, Holy Lord, upon this land. We call your name upon this land. We call your name upon this land. We call your name upon this land. Upon this land. Jesus name. We will not give up. We will not give up. Jesus' holy name. The godly heritage is captive in this land. The godly heritage is captive in this land. We pray right now for it to be released we pray right now for it to be released give them up give them up give them up father is calling give them up give them up give them up Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Everybody say, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you all. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team, as always. Hallelujah. Just think about what Paul said. That he said we are uh, killed all the day long. Hallelujah. That'd be a long dying, but nevertheless, he goes on to say that yet we are not destroyed. We're not forsaken. Amen. We have the victory in Jesus. Amen. We need one another because, uh, you know, the enemy likes to, he, he is as a roaring lion. He goes about seeking whom he may des destroy. And of course, he's not a roaring lion, but he's, he acts like one. And he likes to get you separated. You know, if you ever watch any of the Discovery shows or any network, uh, they'll have these animal deals on and, and a lot of times they'll have lions or tigers or whatever. And how they hunt, they, they always go after the either a weak one, a young one, or one that is separated from the rest of the yeah. uh, herd. Amen. And uh, that's the way he uh, is able to uh, get his, his meal. Amen. And destroy. And that's, the enemy does the same thing. And that's why I think Jesus talks about, you know, for that one lamb that is lost. He'll go to any extent to find that one sheep. Amen. And bring it back into safety. Praise the Lord. Yeah. And uh, I've heard it said, and you may have as well, but, uh, you know, what did that one lamb do to be saved? He just consented to be picked up by the shepherd and carried back. Hallelujah. Yeah. That's good news. Amen. Yeah. The lamb didn't have to do anything other than just allow himself to be saved. Praise yeah. the Lord. He just trusted, hallelujah, in the shepherd. And that's the same thing we do. Amen. Yeah. God is great. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. <coughs> Well, I appreciate all the testimonies this morning, and for those of you that may have been shocked that uh, the pastor goes through spiritual battles like everybody else, get over it, hallelujah, yeah. because, uh, amen, I'm, I'm the first one to tell you I'm just like everybody else, amen, this is just what I do, amen, it doesn't give me any special powers or strengths that you don't have, we all have the Lord, we all have the ability to overcome, but, uh, amen, sometimes stuff just keeps coming and coming and coming until you just... You start focusing on the stuff instead of on Jesus. Amen. I'm not defeated. I'm not destroyed. We just get discouraged sometimes. And, ha and that's why we come together. Amen. Yes. You don't know who's going to have the word that God's trying to say to you. Because a lot of times it's hard to hear the Lord by yourself. I don't know why it is, but there's something about the Bible says that we magnify the Lord. Yes. Well, think about that. Amen. When all of us come together, it isn't that God gets any bigger, but I get a better opportunity to hear from different people, God becomes bigger. Amen. He's able to speak to me in ways that I just am not getting. Amen. On my own. Praise the Lord. So uh, it's important that we forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. Not just so that we can be religiously strict about never missing church, but about being able to come together and hear from the Lord and, and allow the Lord to speak to us in, in ways that maybe he wouldn't speak to us personally. Amen. Not that he wouldn't, but we just don't often hear him. Amen. When we're, we're in the middle of the battle. Praise the Lord. So I want to start off this morning with a, with a little story. You may have heard this before. It's a true story. And I'm trying to think of the man's name. I think it's, I want to say Peretti, but I used to know some had friends named Pizzetti. So I may just be making it up. Amen. I, don't, I know his name was something like that. It was an Italian name. But anyway, uh, he, he wrote a book called This Present Darkness. You may have read it. And it's all about spiritual warfare and everything else. But this is a true story. He happened to be in, I don't know if it was Mexico or Central America or Honduras or Colombia, but somewhere in, the, in Central America, in that area of South America. But he was there doing uh, a series of uh, evangelistic meetings and helping some local pastors build some churches and so forth. And he had just got back into this town. I don't remember the name of the town, so please, I'm not making up. I just don't have a good memory of all this. But... I do remember the story and the, the factual side of it. So he, he gets back, and it's like 2.30, quarter to 3 in the morning, and he's starving. He hasn't eaten anything since that morning. So he's going every try, wandering all over the place, trying to find some place that's open to get something to eat. And he finds a bar. So he goes into the bar, and he sits down and orders a taco and a, you know, something. And, and about the time they bring his food, in comes this whole cubby, if, if you will, of, of women, of girls. It's like 3.30 in the morning now. 
and there's like 25, 30 of these women come in, and he, and he realizes these are prostitutes. They've been working all night. Everything else is closed down now, so they, this is where they congregate after their night's work. And he's sitting there, and he, he hears this one woman, and I'll, call, I'll just say her name was Maria, and, and she goes up to this other prostitute, and she says, uh, tomorrow's my birthday. And the girl looks at her. She said, today's my birthday. It's like 3.30 in the morning. And the, and the gal looks at her uh, kind of odd and says, and? What do you want me to do about it? Throw you a party? No. She said, I'm just saying. It's, it's my birthday. So they continue to talk and have a few drinks and whatever. And then they leave. This pastor, who no one knows that he's a pastor. They just, some guy, some Anglo that's in there eating at 3.30 in the morning. He goes up to the bartender and he said, uh, why, don't, why don't we throw a party, a birthday party, for Maria? And the bartender looks at him like he's crazy, figuring that, well, he's an American. He's got to be nuts or he wouldn't be here in the first place, you know. And he said, no, seriously. He said, I'll pay for it. But he said, Look, I, we'll get some decorations and put up a big banner, happy birthday, Maria, and, and, and I'll get a cake made and, and bring it. And tomorrow night when they all come in, we'll have a birthday party for them. And the bartender says, hey, if you want to spend the money, it's okay with me. There won't be anybody else in here at 3.30 in the morning anyway but them. So sure enough, the next following night, they, he comes in. They put up this big banner, and they've got tinsel and stuff hanging from the lights and, and a big birthday cake that says, happy birthday, Maria. Well, about 3.30, again, here they all come. All these gals come in. And this Maria walks in, and she just freaks out when she sees the the sign and the birthday cake, and she picks up the cake and heads out the door, and he said, wait, 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 where are you going? He said, we're having a party for it. She said, i got to show this to my mother. I've never had a birthday party. I've, no one ever baked a birthday cake for me. This is the first time this has ever happened in my life, and I, I have to show this to my mom. She's just a couple doors down here. He said, okay, but you got to come back because the party's just getting started. And she's crying and carrying on. And she takes the cake, comes back a few minutes later with the cake, and she's just blubbering and, and just crying like crazy. I've never had a party. Nobody ever baked a cake for me. And this pastor says, can I pray for you? And she said, you never told us you were a pastor or you were a preacher. And he said, no, but he said, I just, I just want to pray for you. I, I know God wants to do something great for you. And so she allowed him to pray. And several of the other girls came, and he prayed with them. And the long of the story, the short of the story is, she, got, she accepted the Lord that night, received Christ. And so did several of these other women. Just because of a little gesture, something that had not, just touched her so deeply that some stranger would throw a party for her, this prostitute, you know. And it just it touched her so deeply that she was open then for the opportunity for God to, to speak to her. And sure enough, she gets saved. So with that, I want to kind of use that as a context for what I want to talk to you about this morning. So let's go to, Roberto, if you will, Genesis chapter 28, verses 16 and 17. Because I think sometimes we... We miss God yeah. when we shouldn't be missing him. Right. And I'm guilty as anybody, but I, I don't want to live my life that way. No. So Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. If you remember... Jacob had lined down, laid down, he was running away, and he, he has this vision or this dream. And in the dream, he sees a ladder come down from heaven, and on this ladder are angels ascending and descending from God. And uh, then he goes on, and this, when he wakes up, this is what he says. And out, out of his sleep, he said, the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. And this is the gate of heaven. God was here, and I didn't know it. Amen. And here's, here's what I'm saying is that for most people, God consciousness is prompted when we are in some kind of a religious setting. In a church service, uh, as uh, Suzanne was talking about, we go to special meetings and 
quote unquote revivals and so on and so forth because we want to have experience the presence of God. And we think that God is going to be there or here because it's church, right? Because it's religious. And surely God has to be there, right? We expect to sense the presence of God when we are in church. And thankfully, we aren't disappointed, right? But God doesn't restrict his presence to the places that are obviously religious. In fact, he's most of the time, often at least, more active in places where we might not expect to find him. Praise the Lord. And as believers, we, we need to be looking for the surprising places where God can be found so that we can join him in the amazing things that he's doing. Praise God. God shows up at places that we wouldn't expect. Look at Exodus chapter 3, uh, verses 2 and 3. Thank the Lord. Praise the Lord. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. Uh, go down to verse 5 here. I'm not leaving anything out just for the sake of time here. And he said, this is the Lord speaking now, draw not nigh hither, but or put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place wherein thou, whereon thou standest is holy ground. Amen? So let me ask you a question. I'll, I'll even make it in the format that I always enjoy, which is multiple choice because you got a better shot at getting it right. Amen? <laughs> I, loved the, I, hated, I hated the essay que questions, you know, on a test, but I loved the multiple choice because I figured <laughs> you can always maybe get one. Amen? But if you saw a burning bush... Would you A, call 911, <laughs> B, get the hot dogs, or C, recognize God? The two passages of Scripture that we've already read here this morning reveal a flaw in our usual expectations because we expect to find God in religious places. And so we often ignore that he might be in places we don't expect him to be. The thing about God is he's at work everywhere. He's at work all the time. Jesus said, my father worketh, so I work. What he meant was whatever God's doing, I want to be in agreement with it. I, I want to be a part of it, right? So he, God wants it to make the ordinary extraordinary. Amen? Amen? For everybody, for all of us. Every place, he said here, of course, this is Old Testament, Old Covenant, but he says to Moses, take off your shoes because getting closer, you're on holy ground here. But the truth is, under this dispensation, under the New Covenant, amen, every place is sacred with God yes. because he's everywhere. Yes. And he invites us in to his presence, yes. amen, just as you are. Are you going to see a ladder or a burning bush? I mean, it's possible, but it's really not that likely. But you do go to restaurants. Mm -hmm. You do go to the grocery store, Walmart, Target, Target, for those of you. <laughs> He's in bars. I uh, ran into an old friend of mine. That was last week. I can't remember. I go through Bondurant every once in a while. My mother's, the house that I grew up in is there. And, you know, it's just a nostalgia thing. I go by. We sold the house after mom had to go in a nursing home. And um, I go by just to see if they're changing everything or whatever they're doing. And they have, they've done some cosmetic things, but the house is, everything's pretty much the same as it always was. So I just go by just out of nostalgia, I guess. And I stopped at Casey's. <coughs> <laughs> to get some gas. And this kid, I want to say a kid that I knew for years, he's, that day was his birthday. He was 65. He was turning 65 that day. And uh, he hollered at me and he said, hey, come on, man. Come get a, uh, have a beer with me. There's a bar there in Bondurant. It's a restaurant and a bar. And uh, 
I said, you know, my first thought was, yeah, okay. <laughs> so I went with him, and uh, we sat down and had a sandwich, and, and I actually had a beer. In fact, I had two beers. <laughs> and uh, he had several, because I was buying. And uh, it was his birthday, after all. <laughs> but it was his birthday, you know. And we were talking, and he, you know, just, just, just talking about old times and what we did when we were young and stupid things that we did and friends of ours that have now died and, you know, those kinds of things. And, but it was, it was fun. I mean, it was upbeat. It, it was not negative. And out of the clear blue, now I wasn't talking about Jesus. I wasn't telling him, you've got to get saved and you better get your life together and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Out of the clear blue, he's, he's been talking about his kids. That, you know, he'd put them through college. He's a, a carpenter. Builds houses and things, and, and uh, he he was talking about his kids, how proud he was of them. You know, one had finished college, and his son got uh, a daughter that's married, and living out of state, got a good job. You know, he was just like any parent would. He was just proud of them, not bragging. Just you know, I'm just so proud of these kids. You know, they all did good, and because uh, he's just an average guy, you know, but his kids are all doing better than he did, which is what he's excited about. And out of the clear blue, he says, you know, Nate, I, I never tried to push Jesus on my kids. And I said, really? He said, no, I just, I never did. And I said, but you did push them to go on to college and so that they would get a good education, be able to get a good job, take care of themselves, didn't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. He said. I said, well, then why wouldn't you want to push Jesus on them? He's a, he'd be the best thing that any of them could have. I wasn't being critical of him. I was just saying, I was just making the, the difference, you know. And he said, I, I, just, I guess I just wanted them to, you know, to find that for themselves. And I said, well, you wouldn't leave them to find everything else for themselves when they were growing up. You'd, you'd do everything you could to help them avoid dangers and pain and so on and so forth. So we talked a little bit longer, and I didn't force it on him or anything, but I could see he was a little bit troubled, you know, and uh, not mad, just, you know, thinking about the whole thing, you know. So he got, we got ready to leave. He got, in fact, his wife called because they were going to the fair that night to see some band that imitates all the other bands. <laughs> he said, man, it's like you close your eyes. It's 1965 again, you know, and all that stuff. Uh, man, if I close my eyes, I thought it was 1965. I'm, there ain't no telling what I might do, so I don't, I don't even <laughs> want to go there, you know. But anyway... He had, he had he come back in after he talked to his wife. He come back in. He said, I got to get going. She's, she's going to be waiting on me. So I said, great. Good seeing you again. Happy birthday. You know, nice talking and everything. And he said, uh, let me get your number. He said, I, I want to call you. Yes. And I said, well, you better text me because if I get a phone call from somebody and I don't know the number, I don't answer. <laughs> and I won't for the next year and a half because it's political season. Yes. And you're... Everybody and his brother's out there trying to get it buck, so <laughs> hallelujah, amen. I'll vote, but yeah. keep my money at the same time. So anyway, so he, and he said, I, I want to talk to you about this. Yes. So Thank praise you. the Lord. So I'm just saying, you say, well, come on, you're a pastor, and, and you went into a bar and yeah. ate and drank a couple of beers. Yeah. Yeah, I did. So I don't want to shock you. I don't want to freak you out, but. The truth is, I'd rather eat in a bar than drink in a restaurant. Because, I'll let you sort through that. But the truth is, hey, I'll, I'll tell you what, most bars, and I, I've talked, I won't, I won't, I'm not going to say, but I had somebody tell me this once, and they're absolutely right. Most of the bars got the best food. They do. I mean, I'm not saying there aren't good restaurants, but if you just want a good hamburger or a sandwich or, you know, Bars are the place to go. <laughs> I'm not trying to get you to go to a bar, and I'm not trying to get you to drink. I'm just saying, God was there before I got there. It didn't bother him to be in that bar, so why should it bother me? Now, I'm not talking about going and getting stupid drunk and falling down, making a fool out of yourself, or getting arrested for drunk driving or anything else. I'm just saying, God was there because he knew Greg was going to be there. But God needed somebody exactly. to speak for him. Yes. Praise yes. the Lord. 
the places and the circumstances are always different. But the thing that they have in common is that they aren't church. Whether it's the grocery store or on your job or a restaurant or a bar or whatever. Amen? And God is there. And God is working to get your attention. Amen? So that he can move you to action. God is not rarely, I'm not saying he doesn't, but he rarely speaks in an audible voice anymore unless it's yours. Or mine. If you're watching for burning bushes, you'll be amazed at where you might find them. Praise the Lord. I, I just, let me say this. A God that you completely understand is not God. A God that you can comprehend totally is an idol. Because he's no bigger than you are. His ways are past finding out. I'm not saying that we don't have revelation and that we don't know God and that we don't have a relationship. But as Tammy was saying this morning too, relationship, as you grow in the relationship, you, listen, let me tell you something. I know Sally a whole lot different now than I did 35 years ago. Amen? Amen? She's, she's not any different. You know what I mean? She's still, she's the Sally, you know? But my understanding of her and my knowledge of her and my relationship with her was limited. Amen? And that was a joke, by the way, earlier when I said I, I was a fool when I married you. And she said, I know, but I was in love and didn't notice. So, praise the Lord. <laughs> she could have said it, but... She did, praise the Lord. <laughs> See, our God became human. And he lived among us. And he revealed his purposes and his plans for us. And we've got this thing. I was talking about this, I think, Wednesday night, too. Uh, on here are just names of God. And uh, just for an example... We know, this is how we know God, right? That's why God gave the names that he gave to the patriarchs and to the, to, the, to the Jewish people when he called them out of Egypt and gave them the law and so on and so forth because they didn't know him. They knew about him, but they really didn't know him, so he had to reveal his, his character and his attributes uh, in some way. So he did himself or defined himself with another name, right? He said, you've known me as this, but... I want you to know me like this. Right. So he was Jehovah Jireh, right? The God who provides, our provider. That's one character of God is he, he provides for us. He's our provider, right? Jehovah Shalom. God is our peace. He gives us peace that passes understanding, right? He's Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. Yes. The healer, right? And we know even more about God through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus because he said, I'm going to give him a name that's above every name, right. Savior. Yes. Yes. Amen. And within the context of that word Savior or salvation, which is sozo, it's in Greek it's sozo. It means everything. It's c completeness. In other words, you, in all of these names, you have these yes. evidences and, of characters of God or characteristics of God. In Jesus, it all comes together. He is our healer. Amen. Yes. He is our peace. He's the Prince of Peace. He's our King. Uh, you know, our Lord, our God, our Savior. All of these things are encapsulated in Jesus. So we know God better as a result of Jesus coming and revealing God to us. Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. So because we know these things about God, we think we know enough to figure God out. Right? Because we have this revelation and we, and we know these different attributes and different characteristics of God and the fullness of this revelation in Christ, then we think we know it all. I don't mean to be weird, but we just think we've got it figured out, right? We think we know enough to treat him as the sum of his parts. Right? As if we've solved the puzzle, amen, and he's the answer. If you can explain everything about God, it's probably not God. Right. Yeah. Exactly. 
I mean, I've had God do some, some really, really strange things that I didn't have Scripture for. Now, afterwards, I see the principle. It wasn't a fluke. It wasn't untrue. It's just I would have never guessed he would do it that way. I never expected him to do it like that because I thought I had it kind of figured out that he had, he's going to do it like this. He's got to do it this way because, after all, I mean, this is why we buy lottery tickets, isn't it? God wants to bless me. He wants to bless me financially. He does. He wants to. He became poor that I might be rich. So I've got it figured out that the only way he's going to really get the big bucks is I've got to hit that, you know, i got to hit the real one. i got to hit the big one. God's got to, you know, I told Sally, I quit buying lottery tickets, not because it's evil or anything else, but just because I'm limiting God. I've, I've narrowed him down to this Iowa lottery for crying out loud, you know. So I'm not doing it anymore. I'm not, gonna, I'm not spending my money. I'm not giving him, you know, five bucks a week or whatever. It wasn't like a lot of money. I wasn't going out and buying 5,000 tickets or anything, five bucks a week or whatever. But I just, as a way of saying to God, look, you can do this any way you want to. I'm not going to restrict you here to the Iowa lottery, praise the Lord. So I'm just saying that's kind of the way we think, though. We have a tendency to kind of zero in and say, okay, this is how he's going to do it. It's like healing or anything else. God's got to do it a certain way. We don't, we don't know how he's going to do it. We, he, he, he can do it any way he wants to. He can use a doctor if he wants to. He can just heal you in your bed. He can do it in a church service. He can do it any way he wants. But he's the one that's going to do it. Amen? Thank you, Lord. So let's look at this. Job chapter 26 and verse 14. Lo, these are the parts of his ways, but how little a portion is heard of him, but the thunder of his power. Who can understand? There was a time when Job was the wisest man on earth as well as the richest, and he didn't get it. He didn't really understand. Praise the Lord. I'm saying all this this morning because God wants to use us not only for our benefit, but for as Roberto was saying, there's people out there that are, that are caught in a very vulnerable place right now. Yes. And I think, as the Bible says, the end times is going to be the greatest revival there will yes. ever be. And the reason there will be is because people are in chaos. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for answers. They're vulnerable. Yes. And that's why the lunatic fringe, I call them, that are the government and, and uh, the science and so forth that come rushing in with a new claim on everything. You know, I hear them every time it's, you know, global warming because the temperature is up. Yeah. All right, believe what you want to believe, okay? I'm not buying that car, praise the Lord. I just, I, I don't get it. I, I, I'm saying I've lived as long as I've lived, and I don't really see a whole lot of difference. It's hot in the summer. It's cold in the winter. Yeah. Amen. The only thing I'd say is it's rained more this summer than I can remember because my sump pump has, is still running in August, and usually it's long been shut off. It's not been running since July. But, so we got more rain, but it's not any hotter than it ever was. Amen. I got sunburns as a kid running through the streets, amen, playing. So it, 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 nothing has really changed, amen, in my, in my opinion. And, of course, you know opinions are like, <laughs> Everybody's got one, hallelujah, so you can, you're, you're entitled to your own. Yeah. You, and you're entitled to be wrong, so praise the Lord. Yeah. Psalms 145, verse 3. Psalms 145, verse 3. One forty five, I'm sorry. One forty five verse three. That's Suzanne's scripture for the morning. Sorry. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Praise the Lord. Jeremiah nine and verse twenty four. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Praise God. So, how much can we know about God? 
how much are we supposed to know about God? Well, the balance is actually you can't know God fully, but you can know him truly. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 2 through 4. So you're not going to know God fully in this life, but you can know truly, which is what we were talking about Wednesday night when it comes to revelation. The full revelation of God is in Christ. There's nothing more that God has to do to reveal who he is and what he is. He's given us the exact representation of God in Christ. But that doesn't mean we understand it all. Right? If you've heard of the dispensation of grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four and few words, whereby when you read, read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. All right, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. Got several scriptures here just to kind of put this together. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Yes. All right, Ephesians 6, verse 19. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Mm -hmm. yes. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 9. holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. 1 Corinthians 13 and 12. 13 verse 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Now, I don't, don't misunderstand me. Christianity really does make sense. But a lot of the questions that we ask God can't be answered directly. And it's not because God doesn't know the answer, but it's because we ask questions that don't make sense to God from his point of view. It's like somebody asking, is yellow square or round? Or like how many miles are there in an hour? I mean, that's what it's got to sound like to God when we ask some of the things that we ask yeah. because, we don't, because we don't understand. We ask questions that don't make sense. Right? right? Mm -hmm. From God's point of view, it sounds crazy. And Christianity will never make sense to you if you think God is angry and yeah. evil and out to get you or that he's indifferent about your situation or that he's anemic and unable to do anything about it or that he's indecisive, right? Or that he's distant and, and, and separated from us and doesn't care. Christianity will never make sense. That's why there's, there's so many people out there that don't embrace Christianity or accept Christ because they've got a totally misconception about God. They're, they're, they don't know God. I, I understand. You know, God is holy. God is righteous. God is just. There's no question about it. But God is also full of mercy yes. and grace. Yes. And God extends his forgiveness, his grace, and his mercy to us free of charge. Yes. Yes. But the problem is, they can't be extended without the consequence of death. Because he's just. Because he is holy. Because he is righteous. He's a just God. So he requires a penalty for sin. But in the ultimate act of love, God, in the flesh, unrecognized, by the way, by those who were here on earth, his creation, gave himself to be crucified for our sins. Yes. Being sinless himself, he paid the price. And Christ's death proved God's love for us. And his resurrection proved that it was God. Exactly. Exactly. Amen? 
Now, God's everywhere. And if you recognize his presence everywhere, this mystery that Paul's talking about begins to unfold. God extends his offer of salvation to everybody everywhere. Prostitutes in bars in Central America. An old friend in a bar in Iowa. in the most unlikely places because we've made God this so standoffish and so holy and so righteous. Hey, he's in the bar waiting for somebody to loose that S word, the sword. Praise the Lord. We think, oh my God, that's, that's just, that's so hypocritical. Oh my God. Give me a break. The first miracle Jesus performed yeah. is turning water into wine at a wedding ceremony. I, it, don't give me that grape juice stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it was wine. If it was grape juice, he'd have said grape juice. Yeah. It was wine. Wine is what they drank at weddings. You go to a, they, they still drink it at weddings. Yeah. I told my cousins, I, I did a wedding for my cousin and uh, her fiance. <laughs> it was outdoor wedding. And they didn't ask me what the rules were, so I didn't give them any. I got there, and they had a keg, and, you know, they had beer and everything else. And they're sitting around out there with their beer and everything else. I said, well, you know, Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine. Now, here, I don't think it would have been any more difficult, but it would have had to turn into Bud Light, apparently, because <laughs> that's what everybody was drinking. Hallelujah. He said, well, that's just being sacrilegious. And, and No, come on. God was there. I, ta- I, had, I, talked, I had more conversations with people about Jesus at that wedding where people yes. are drinking than I had in church. Yeah. Because yeah. these people don't go to church. Right. But they still want to hear from Jesus. Yes. And Jesus still definitely wants to talk to them. He yes. wasn't embarrassed because they were drinking beer at the wedding. He wasn't put off. I wasn't uh, offended. I didn't feel like, oh, how could you do this? I'm, after all, I'm a pastor. I did wait till after the wedding before I drank a beer. You can ask Sally. I didn't drink anything until the wedding was over, did I? I had one beer and I had to leave because I had to drive quite a ways to get home. But I'm just saying. I'm not, I'm not, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not promoting alcohol or drinking or drunkenness or anything else. I'm just saying we have made some stuff sin that God never called sin. Yeah. Drunkenness, yes. Huh? I mean, when it starts to destroy relationships and you can't support a family and do the things that you're supposed to, it's time to back off and say, hey, yeah. I'll pass. I'll have a Pepsi, you know. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But having a beer or drinking wine or th- those kind that's not sin. It's not a sin. It's throughout the Bible. Every time, I've, t- I've said this over and over and over. We get these religious concepts because that's what we've been taught. Yeah. And I know the reason is because we think that if, uh, if you give them a little, they'll take a mile. But that's not my job. That's your job. That's your responsibility yeah. to be adult and to be responsible and whatever. Amen? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. I had a, let, me, let me just throw this in. I, you, you probably heard me, too. some of you may have, but years, I'm talking to 30 years ago or more. We were in, when we were in East Texas, we were in church, and the pastor, the original pastor, had retired, and he was then Pastor Emeritus, Brother Hoyt. Now, this guy was hardcore. I mean, this was an old-time Pentecostal holiness preacher. Everything was wrong. Everything was sin. I don't care what it was. It was sin. Yeah. And that's the truth. Just, and he told this one time. He was preaching, and he told this story. He said, this was... He was talking about something that had happened in the 50s. And some of the kids from the youth group came to him and said, Brother Hoyt, is it okay if we play uh, putt-putt golf? And he, honestly, he said this. He said, I didn't know what putt-putt golf was. I'd never heard of it before. So I told him, absolutely no, you cannot play. <laughs> and he didn't even know what it was. Yeah. But he thought, if they come to ask me, it probably isn't good. So he just said no. Now that's the mentality of a lot of people in church. 
they just had this preconceived idea that if I'm enjoying it, it must be wrong. It's got to be sin. And if there's a lot of people not being reached today, it's because we are so scared of sin, we don't put any confidence in the Lord. Jesus went to prostitutes. He didn't hire them or use them in that sense. But he went to them to extend the love of God. Thieves. Tax collectors. The, the scourge of the earth at that time in Israel. Because they worked for the Romans. And they didn't just tax them like we get taxed today. They had the ability to just stick them whenever they wanted to. For anything they wanted. So it wasn't just like, well, I'm going to collect the 3% sales tax. Or 6% or whatever it might have been at the time. I can also say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tax you for that vase. I'm going to tax you for that amphora of, uh, of wine. They could do whatever they wanted to because they were a legal representation of the Roman government, and the, that's how they got their money. Right. They, the taxes they collected for Rome, they had to turn over to Rome. So then they were given the liberty to rip people off because of their position. So they were hated. They were despised. They were the most despicable people on the planet. And Jesus says, come on, I'm coming to your place for lunch today. And you can bet the rabbis and the average yeah. Jewish people around there were going, my God, this guy, he's going to go and eat with him? Yeah. And while he's there, yeah. he says, let me tell you a story. All these rabbis and others are there just hanging around saying he's eating with sinners. He's hanging out with sinners. He's going to the bar with sinners. Yeah. He's got prostitutes washing his feet, yeah. pouring oil in his hair. So let me tell you a story about a boy who asked his father for all of his inheritance. He took his money and he split. Spent it all on prostitutes and on drunken living. Woke up one day broke. Got kicked out of the apartment. No place to live. No job. In a distant land, he goes to work for a Gentile feeding his hogs. The lowest possible job for a Jew, mm -hmm. unclean animals, and you're out there. And he, and he even went so far as to say, you know, I'm so hungry. I would like to eat what they're eating. Their diet is better than my diet. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've ever been on a hog farm, I'll tell you how hungry this kid was, right? Yeah. <laughs> so he, he makes this plan up, and he says, hey, you know what? I remember at Dad's place, yeah. the servants got good quarters. They got great food. They get treated decent. I'll just go home and ask my dad if he'll just hire me as a servant. Because I know I'm, I, I have no right to come and be his son anymore. On his way to the father, the father sees him in the distance and runs to him. Embraces. Doesn't even let him give the story. Right? He just hugs him and kisses him. And the guy's barefoot, stinking, filthy robe, just disgusting. And the father says, get the servant, bring sandals for his feet. Bring a new robe. Bring my ring. I want everybody to know this is my kid. Put the ring on his finger. And kill the fatted calf, we're going to have a party. My son that was lost is now alive. He was dead but to me, and now he's alive again. That's how God thinks about every one of you. That's how he thinks about every person out there in the world that he died for. That's right. yes. But they think, if I come slinking to God with all of my crap and all the mess that I've made of my life, he's going to say, sorry, you've gone too far. Yeah. You had your chance and you blew it. But Jesus was telling this story in front of all of these Pharisees and all these religious people to get them to understand God loves that sinner, that yes. Samaritan, that prostitute, that, uh, he loves them like they're his child because they are. He wants them to come home. He wants them to be his child. He wants to bless them. He wants to provide for them. He wants to heal them. Praise the Lord. We need to start looking at people differently. Because God doesn't look at them the way we do too many times. 
He extends his offer of salvation to everybody, everywhere, yes. and he does it by extending that offer through us. Yes. So if you're not where they are, you're not going to be able to extend the offer. Because sadly, most of those people are not going to show up here on Sunday morning unless Jesus meets them someplace else first. Praise the Lord. Exactly. This offer is based completely on the sacrifice of Jesus. You don't have to judge. You don't have to question. You don't have to know. Because the offer that you're extending was made by Jesus. There is no performance required on our part. It's just as amazing as it sounds. That's why we sing that song, Amazing Grace. We've made it less amazing, I'm sorry to say. But it is amazing, if you really understand it. Those who put their faith or their trust in Jesus are immediately restored to intimacy with this almighty God of the universe, the creator of it. It's, I mean, it's mind-blowing. Just like our salvation, our continuing relationship with God is not performance-based. Perfection is not required. In fact, it's not even expected. I'll say that again. It's not even expected. God's love, God's grace, His forgiveness is extended to us with His foreknowledge that we're going to screw up, that we're going to fail. That's why He made the covenant with Himself, because He knew under the old covenant Though it was dependent on the people to do certain things, which they never could do, and were never intended to be able to do. It was to force them to a place where they'd say, I need a Savior. I can't do it. I can't keep these rules. I can't keep all the laws. I can't do everything I'm supposed to be doing. I need a Savior. So that when the Savior showed up, they would turn to him. And they will. They will. It's amazing. But at the same time, it's logical, it's, it's rational, and it's compelling. When you understand that God is amazing, then you'll understand amazing grace. He's so much more than we understand him to be. He's so different than we have believed him to be. God's everywhere much as that seems like a mystery or mysterious that God would be everywhere in a brothel in a crack house in a bar in a beer joint that's exactly right look for him everywhere even when you don't understand it and remember look look at this Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 verses 18 and 19 I hope I'm not being misunderstood, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to try to quantify or qualify everything I'm saying. I'm just saying, you're adults. You have a relationship with the Lord. Trust Him. Yeah. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. God told me that when I first got saved. God spoke to me through that scripture and told me that. I didn't get it. I didn't understand it any more than I understood all of Isaiah 54 that he gave me at the same time. It's it's been 30 some years and I'm still understanding what God was trying to tell me clear back then because my idea of God didn't fit what God was saying. I'm asking the questions, you know, is yellow round or square? God is saying yes. 
and I'm not figuring it out. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Right. Amen. That's right. What part of that don't we get yeah. as a church? Right. Amen. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. That's the message we're supposed to be taking to people, not to get yourself cleaned up and get your act together, and God might extend a little mercy to you. No, God has already given his life for you in the middle of all your junk. He didn't tell that prostitute, go, get cleaned up, take 30 days, no sex, no, no, yeah. nothing like that, and just get your act together, and then come back and talk to me, and maybe, yeah. maybe uh, then you'll be holy enough and righteous enough, clean enough and respectable enough that I can meet with you. Now, in the middle of all of that degradation yeah. and, and humiliation for her, God loved her, yes, he cared for her, yes. declared her to be worthy yes. and have Thank worth you. and value, so much so that he gave himself for her. He wanted to throw a party for her. He wants a party for everybody. A new birth party. Amen? A new birthday party. Hallelujah for the being born again. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. All right. Uh, 2 Corinthians. Stay in 2 Corinthians and look at verse 12. Chapter 12, I'm sorry, and verse 9. <coughs> chapter 12, verse 9. We'll wrap up. This is the last scripture. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So God has reconciled us by his grace. He a reconciler. Everywhere. Anywhere. Amen? You want to be like God? We were created in his image, by the way. If you want to be like him, be a reconciler. Be a forgiver. Be an extender of grace everywhere you go. Not just here. Here it's a given. Here we come with the expectation of God's favor and God's blessing and God's uh, presence. But we are 90% of the time somewhere else. And those people that are in the somewhere else, have no contact with God unless it's from us. And are we so fearful that I'm going to be defiled by going? No. Jesus said, he asked the question, he said, well, does, does, the, does the altar sanctify the sacrifice? Or does the sacrifice sanctify the altar? Yeah. And what that's telling me is you can go anywhere and you're still sanctified. You're still set apart to God. Right. You can be any place, anywhere, with anyone yes. and still be God's representation. Yeah. Still be an, ex an expression of God. Yeah. Because God is way less concerned about our rigid perfectionism than we are. Amen? Amen. You, you, you'd be surprised how open people become to the things of God when it's the goodness of God and the love of God that you're expressing. Yes. You know, I've told this before too, my dry cleaner, the guy that does my dry cleaning, he's always given me clothes. I've got, there's, there's a table downstairs right now. In fact, y'all are welcome to go down and pick through it. Because whatever we don't use, I end up giving to Tom Stammen, and he takes it and sells it out of a thrift shop up in Minneapolis. But, he, you know, about every month, he'll give me a whole back seat full of clothes. Most of the time, they're really good clothes. I mean, people don't pay to have dry cleaning done on rags, you know. So he gives it to me to give away, to give to the church, to give to people who have needs, and so on and so forth. So I bring them here and let people look. If there's something you can use, you're welcome to it. If not, eventually they'll end up going to Tom. But this guy, he, you, if you didn't know, you would think he was the biggest 
sinner in the world. He's always telling me about how he went drinking here and he was drinking with this guy and he was doing this and, you know, and, and he, he loves to tell me dirty jokes just, just to see if I'll listen, you know, and if I'll respond. He's always got some off-color thing to tell me. So I get a lot of material from him. I just have to kind of edit it a little bit, praise the Lord. But, you know, Every three or four times I'll go in there, he'll ask me to pray with him yes. about yeah. a grandson, about a, a, one of his boys going through some difficulty with a marriage or something, and, or his wife, or his mother when she was sick. Yeah. The other day he asked me, he said, would you, he said, I, I, I've got a really good friend of mine whose parents are very religious. In fact, they are, he said, they're priests or pastors or something like that, whatever they call them, he said. And uh, he said, but they won't let them, they won't give their consent or their blessing to the wedding, to the marriage, unless they go through a four-week wedding seminar thing. And he said, they, her parents live in California or someplace. And he said, so they got to have somebody to do it here locally. He said, would you be willing to do it? I said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a try. I said, I don't know when they're going to want to do it. I've got some stuff going on right now. i got a wedding this coming Friday, and then i got to go to Arkansas to do another wedding in first of October, but I said, have them call me and we'll work out something. If, if we can make the schedule work for, for everybody, I'll do it. So there's a guy who, who now sees Jesus in a whole different way yeah. than he ever did before. Does it, did it make him a perfect quote unquote Christian? No, but he's trusting God yeah. because now he wants prayer, yeah. where before he would have just mocked it and made fun of it. Right. But now he does believe that God cares about his situation, his children, his marriage, and so on and so forth. And so he wants to reach out to him, but he's just not sure how to do it himself. Right. So he, 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 he I, you could say, okay, he's disrespectful. No, to me, that's the, that's the greatest respect he could ever show me, mm -hmm. is to say, I trust you to pray with me. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't mind a dirty joke once in a while. <laughs> Sir, I even laugh occasionally. But I'm just saying, people need an expression of Jesus. That's, they need God to be revealed to them somehow. Now, I'm, God knows, and you all should know by now, because I'm not very secretive about my life, that I, I'm not trying to be perfect. I, I'm, I'm trying to just wear you out. It will. It'll just wear you out. You won't, you, you'll, you'll still fail. Yeah. Right. At some point, you've got to trust the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. And the world needs that message more than they need to hear anything else. Right. For God so loved the world yeah. that he gave. Yeah. Right. This is not an exclusive club. No. It's all inclusive. Yes, it the offer, the invitation is to everybody, everywhere, in any condition, any time. The only way it's going to get extended is if you and I are not so afraid exactly. of being tainted or, or somehow soiled by the world. Sure. He left us in the world for a reason yes, right. so that we can impact it, so that we can affect it. And the only way you can do it is by having enough confidence in God yes. to reach out, yes. even when it doesn't make sense, even when it doesn't look like that's somebody I would save. Right. You didn't die for him, so don't worry about it. Your job is just to extend the invitation. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap. Yeah. Praise, God. Praise the Lord. Amen. God is good. Brother, you had your hand up. You want to say that? In other words, are you saying this might be a dumb question, but we can bring people closer to God? Absolutely. You don't have to be in church. Absolutely. If we only get it done in church, there's going to be a lot of people lost. There, there was a Yeah, yeah. When we when we have made it, that they're so vile and and so disgusting that we you know we don't want anything to do with them. Why would they come and want to be a part of what we're doing? Just to be humiliated and embarrassed. And, you know, look, every one of us. I don't. Y'all might have been really good people. You know, I'm saying you may not have ever done drugs. You may not have ever got drunk, you may never have gone to jail, you may never have had any marital issues or, 
or you might have really, but you were just as lost exactly. as the worst person out there. Exactly. You're either you're either saved or you're not saved. Yes. You're either spiritually dead or you're spiritually alive. That's the all. That's all there is to it. Now, morally and and culturally, you might have been more acceptable, and there's nothing wrong with that. We we don't want to be pariahs and, and disgusting and everything. But on the other hand, those people are the first ones usually to acknowledge they need a savior. Yes. Amen? Sinners are easier to save than saints. Because the saints don't think they really need a savior. They just need a little help from time to time. No, we're either lost and undone or we're saved by the grace of God. And everybody, everybody needs to know it. And sadly, the church needs to know it. Because there's no way we can extend grace unless we really have embraced it for ourselves. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Amen, amen. I hope you leave here feeling better about yourself because God thinks you're perfect. He told me. Amen. Perfect in Christ. Amen. So go, you perfect people, in Jesus' name. The Lord bless you. Have a great week in Jesus.